Duluth-based rockers American Rebels Get Loud. Actor-director Tom Isbell gets some help writing his first novel. There's a long extended period where it's just me uh, and, and my cat, you know, kind of looking over my shoulder saying, no, I'd strike that. You can't have a really spectacular good guy without a really spectacular villain. John Hoban creates original comics for adults. These artists and more coming up on The Playlist. Funding for The Playlist is provided by the citizens of Minnesota through the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Please welcome American Rebels to the playlist. You can't have a really spectacular good guy without a really spectacular villain. Captain Artichoke. It's a little boy who was born looking like an artichoke. It's not for kids. It's not for kids. It's you know it's kind of like everyone's been picked on a little bit in middle school. Like I blocked a lot of those years out. When you feel that uncomfortable about your body and you're changing and everything like that and people are picking on you, it's just not a fun experience. So I wanted to kind of take that and amplify it by 100 because he's really picked on and he really looks different. And then your release is to like, what if you had these superpowers? You know, you could release all that kind of anguish and stuff and you could actually choose to be, still be, choose to be a good guy, but you know, take it out on people who are um, bad for society. So that's kind of what he does. And the whole thing, it's just a ridiculous premise that's played seriously. So that, and we thought just that alone would be funny. Now that I'm working with a writer for Captain Artichoke, it's, um, I go from his script and I think of the pictures in my mind that I get, and then I sketch them down like really, 
you know, that's not, not bad, but it's not like the best artwork anyone could ever do, but you're put, basically putting all your ideas down on paper. The way I learned to draw a lot of this stuff was I used to open up comic books and I used to, oh, I love Spider-Man. I love the way this guy draws Spider-Man. What's his name? Eric Larson. Oh, I love Eric Larson. He's my new favorite artist. So I used to draw Spider-Man exactly like Eric Larson. And then I'd go and I'd say, oh, Todd McFarlane. Yeah, he draws Spider-Man. Cool. I'll draw just like that. And that's kind of how you learn. You imitate all these other styles and eventually you morph and you get your own. It's good to see you again, Ashley. I need to give you something. It's from your father. Yeah, my father? You mean the guy who got himself shot to shit right in front of me? Okay, how about this? This shows us the origin of this girl. She is like a teenage girl who hasn't been able to grow up because she's been possessed by this weird thing that just pops out once in a while. Please, don't make the same mistake as your father. I... I'm not sure you'll understand. Maybe I won't. But I'm willing to help you with whatever you need. You don't have to walk this path alone. Jed, there you are. Hey. I know you're DVRing the game, but I accidentally checked the score. Want to know the future? <laughs> Get it? <clears throat> anyway, look what I found lying in the middle of the street outside your shop. Oh, hi. Is this yours? Y you look kind of angsty. Apocalypse City is influenced by a lot of the TV shows that I've watched, kind of like Supernatural and Lost. I wanted to build a mythology with a bunch of different characters, kind of like my X-Men where you have a bunch of uh, people who are like regular people with faults uh, and they all have some kind of latent ability and they get together and they're trying to prevent the apocalypse. Ashley, this is Matt Sharp. He's a friend of mine. Matt, this is Ashley Campbell. I would tread lightly. Hello. It's a genuine pleasure. Mm, well, it's all yours. Your phone makes you look like a pedophile. And you look like a little goth candy cane. Great. Matt, I'll be right back. I have something I need to take care of. You kids go on. I'll wait right here. I need people to read my work and they can't do it if I just sell it at like maybe seven conventions a year. So every comic that I make, I put on Facebook. So you can read everything that I've ever done on Facebook. I've been trying to get a hold of you since your release. Oh, uh, why? Your dad left you a storage unit. Really? It wasn't in the will. Yeah, this wouldn't have been in there. I've already made it to be, you know, I could have like three fans on Facebook and I feel like I made it because I'm doing what I want. What makes you think I want anything to do with more of my dad's old junk? Beats me. Take a look. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, okay. Wow. I have a question. Tom Isbell wears many hats. He's an actor and a director, a playwright, and now a novelist. Welcome to the playlist, Tom. Thank you, nice to be here. Congratulations on the book, The Prey. Tell Thank me you. a little bit about that. Uh, it's a dystopian book for young adults set in the future with um, a group of 16-year-olds who are basically fighting for their lives. So in this book, do you take a hopeful view of the future, a cynical view of the future? How do you look at it? I think hopeful. There is a character named Hope, so that probably gives it away right there. I mean, they're, they're up against it, uh, these, these protagonists. And, um, um, but I guess for me, what's affirming about them is that they come together and find skills that they didn't know they had and, and we hope prevail. I don't want to say too much. There are three books. This is the first of a trilogy, so they might not succeed completely in this book um, because they've got two more books of, of conflict ahead. You have an extensive background in acting, in television, in film, in theater. How does that experience influence developing a character in a novel? Uh, similar, and I think the main thing is, you know, all of those are storytelling. And uh, there are different skills, I suppose, and different uh, aspects in terms of structure. But um, it's a story. And so able to draw on that a lot. And the dialogue, of course, kind of comes in a little more naturally, I hope, just because of acting classes, because of writing plays and studying plays. Um, and um, so there's a lot of overlap and connections there. The transition from writing a play mm -hmm. to a novel, um, that's a good challenge. The main thing about, for me, the transition is the writing process, the first part of writing, is so solitary. It, it's just so utterly solitary. 
And then once you start moving the book uh, to the editor and then copy editors and people who are doing book uh, jacket designs, then it gets very collaborative as well. But there's a long extended period where it's just me uh, and, and my cat, you know, kind of looking over my shoulder saying, no, I'd strike that or whatever she says that particular day. Do you get advice from other authors in the in this community? I get advice from anyone uh, who, who's willing to give it to me, and I do have a number of readers, uh, my wife being my first and best reader, but others as well. As soon as I finish a draft, I send it out to them, and, and, and as people who I know are going to be really honest. And then based on that, I do another rewrite, and then I send it to readers, get, you know, do another rewrite, and just keep doing that. I'm going to take you back to the playwright. Put your playwright yeah. hat on okay. for a second. Um, Dear Finder is a play that you researched and wrote that has some Holocaust themes. Right. Um, do you see that coming out in the play? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's uh, that was huge. Uh, uh, I mean, the lesson from the Holocaust was was never again, and uh, we just haven't done the best job of learning that lesson. I mean, we keep we keep you know, finding out and discovering and witnessing other genocides and certainly hate crimes. Um, and so a lot of that is borne out in this book as well. So how did theater get in your blood, that storytelling thing? Do you think it was mom reading you Dr. Seuss or uh, where does that come from? Yeah, probably. Um, I, you know, I don't know for sure. I know that I grew up in a university town in Illinois and my family, everyone on our block worked at the university, and so it was just natural that we would go to the theater there. And so just seeing plays, I remember that having quite a profound effect, and then doing plays, junior high, and then getting a little more serious at each place, high school, and well, why not major in it in college, and et cetera. And do you prefer theater in that live audience? Do you prefer film? You know, you've done all of those platforms. Uh, I think I, theater, just because of that reaction you're always getting from the audience. I mean, there's just no replacing that. You talked briefly a little bit about the um, energy that you get from teaching. Mm -hmm. And, and how that feeds into the whole process. Because the, the students are so willing and engaged and, and excited and they bring their imaginations uh, to class every day. I mean, I'm lucky I teach primarily acting classes, one playwriting class. So it's all about creating solutions and creative solutions. And, you know, I mean, the mantra, it, it, it's kind of a cliche, but it's you know, thinking creatively, working collaboratively, communicating effectively. And that's what I witness every day. And of course, that kind of rubs off on me too. There's a fearless factor that's in there as well. You know, stepping out and saying, okay, I'm going to try a novel. Right. I, I thought, naively, that it, actually this would be safer, that I could just write this in the comfort of my home, which you do, but then all of a sudden you send it out, and then, then there's another level of either rejection letters or acceptances and reviews of all kinds, and so um, there, you do have to be fearless, I think, with anything. Uh, anything that's important should be met with some courage. And, Absolutely. Uh, so and, what, and that's what the characters have to face in this book as well, same thing. So what is the next chapter for Tom? Well, uh, literally the next chapter is book two, uh, which is well along its way. It's with the copy editors right now, and uh, the thing I'm working on right now is, is the third book and finishing um, a, a pretty decent first draft. Uh, I've got a couple holes I need to uh, figure out. Um, but it, uh, other, metaphorically, or, or in the bigger picture, it's the same. It's balancing teaching and writing, both of which I love enormously. And how will you balance that? I'm, I'm trying to find ways to add 24 hours more time to the day, and then I think I'll be fine. Okay. Yeah. Well, share that secret I once will. you develop okay. it. Okay. I'll, I'll get back to you. Book three. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good luck to you. All right, this is called Jim.
Welcome, Kyle and Scott, to the playlist. Thank so you. great to have the American Rebels back on the air. Oh, thank you. Great to be here. There was a new music debut uh, in this set tonight. Absolutely. Brand new, never heard anywhere before. Yeah. Tell me the name it's of it. It's called The Love Song, or Love Song, if you prefer, you know, brevity. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a world debut. And we thought, what better time to do it than here? Tell me the inspiration for the new music that's coming out. Oh, geez. It comes from all over, all places, but... Um, Everything that we've ever listened to, we just kind of pulled from. Maybe it's overindulgent, I don't know. But we just decided we did, wanted to do what we wanted to do, because if we're not making ourselves happy, then why do it? Yeah, we had, we had done some, you know, rock, straightforward rock, and, and we'll do it again, but we, we took more of a, I don't know, a detour into songwriting and a little bit of psychedelia, hopefully, and just kind of pulled from the past bands that we like a lot. And um, yeah, we're excited about it. It's almost done. And the album is called The Desert. The Desert, Because yes. what was your idea behind naming it? Oh, well, that is a, a good question. It just started like in my mind of uh, just kind of going through ups and downs of, of human existence and in a particular time in my life, because um, everyone has something in their life that you need to work through and get over as best you can, you know? And uh, so that's kind of what it's about. This is called Death in the Desert.
So Scott, as the music came through, how did the songwriting piece go? Will I have to read the liner notes to it, find it, out who is responsible <laughs> this, for which this song? Is, this is always uh, a tricky question. Uh, Kyle will come to us with an idea or the full song or bits of songs, and uh, we work through it from there. Add this here, let's do this, do that. Yeah, that's, that's kind of me and Kyle's job, is structuring and framing everything or deciding if it's an idea that's gonna work or not. Because it might be something real fun to play on drums, but we can't get a good idea behind it. And all of a sudden it's like, well, we're just beating a dead horse <laughs> in the desert. Yeah. Now we're going to die out here because we need water. <laughs> exactly. So the whole thing is it all comes together. It was yeah. just a lot of wood woodshed workshop, get together, let's do this. Yeah, and that, the, the, this band is fun for that reason. We fight really hard to, like, to edit the songs and to make them concise when they need to be and to have fun and let loose when they need to be. I can't imagine the American Rebels without Heather. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, Heather would get much more chance to play around anywhere than I ever would. So I don't want it to be that I, everyone feels like I'm dragging her along. So we went and made a decision that she was the right fit. And absolutely, there's no regrets about that. Oh, no. It wouldn't be the band without her, honestly. Bob Olson brings an amazing piece of guitar work to this. Bob what is, does he add? He's up to the game by about a million fold. <laughs> uh, yeah, his musicianship and his playing ability and just his ideas. And Bob rocks. Yeah. I mean, that's what he brings. I mean, he's just Bob. He rocks. Two last questions. Sure. What are you guys listening to now for other music? Uh, our own rough mixes. <laughs> um, it, it tends to kind of consume at least me. <clears throat> so that's what I've been doing. Um, what do you like these days? What are you listening to? <laughs> we I, like I, it all. Yeah, I like it all. I yeah. mean. Well, what do we jam out at, uh, on your record player lately? We did we're listening to the Zeppelin re yeah, reissues. Yeah, we were just supposed to say that. Zeppelin with Chris Robinson on, on vocals. Oh, yeah, they're, yeah. That, that as well. One. And what is your new album called? When is it going to be out? Where do we find information? It'll be called The Desert. Uh, we're finishing it up. In January. In January. Mixing, mastering, and production. So late spring. ASAP. Post homegrown. Just we're grinding it. We're grinding it. We'll hopefully be out, yeah, like you said, yeah. in, in the spring. Where do we find more information? Oh, you can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. The Twitter is... Uh, at AMREBS. At AMREBS. Yeah. Uh, and we're on Reverb Nation and Facebook. And just find and like us on there, and we'll get you all the updates on everything you need yeah. to know. Absolutely. American Rebels, thank you so much. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Awesome. Nice job. Thank you very Way much. Thanks rocket. for having us. Thank you guys.
Thank you.